very relevant to what you're doing for this project, but think of it beyond just this project. All the skills and techniques I'm going to be teaching you all today can apply to what you do when you're looking for a job, what you do when you get a job and you're looking at trying to solve a big problem or create some sort of new innovation within a company. If you want to start your own company or explore a business idea or a nonprofit idea, these are all strategies that you're going to be able to use to, to, to really find the, uh, the, the right solution there. And it's really all about empathy. This is a technique you might have heard of uh, design thinking or empathy-based learning or empathy-based innovation. This is just another sort of subset of empathy-based learning. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a little bit about me and what we do at the Entrepreneurship Center at Launch UNCG. I'll talk about Lean Launchpad, which is the base methodology of, of this whole process. We'll talk about the business model canvas and then I'll dive very deep into customer discovery. But please feel free to ask questions throughout, uh, throughout this presentation because I'm probably going to be covering stuff that you may not have seen before. So a little bit about what we do. Launch UNCG is a new organization here at UNC Greensboro. But anything related to entrepreneurship, innovation, starting a company, starting a nonprofit, getting connected with the business community, my office is going to be a great resource for you. We do a bunch of different events and programs around helping expose students just like yourself to an entrepreneurial path, as well as just getting connected with the local business community to help enhance your career. So a couple of different events that are coming up by the end of this month. One is called the Civic Innovation Competition. And if you visit our website, which is startup.uncg.edu, you can see all kinds of information about everything that we do. And also, I send out a, uh, an email every other week, so all of you should be getting emails from me. My odd last name should look familiar because you've been getting emails from me about, about some of the programs that we do. Um, one, so the Civic Innovation Competition. This is a partnership between UNCG, A&T, County of Guilford, and Greensboro. Uh, the state, or the, excuse me, the, the local government has identified seven different problems that they're having Two of those problems are incorporating technology when it comes to security with, uh, within their municipal buildings. Another one is how to shorten wait times during voting sessions when it's, when it's get out and vote day. Uh, and there's seven other ones, so there's seven total. And what they want for you all to do is, as students, this is just open to A&T and UNCG, is to develop solutions to these seven different problems that they've outlined. The winner of this competition is gonna get $5,000 cash. And there's going to be 10 other teams that are going to get $500 just for submitting your idea online and getting selected as a finalist. So you guys stand a great shot to make a good chunk of cash by the end of this semester. So just check out our website. You'll be able to see more information about it there. Also, if anybody's interested in becoming an entrepreneur or if anybody's interested in the fashion clothing industry, we do a monthly speaker series called Entrepreneurial Journeys, and our next speaker coming up is a young lady named Sarah Evanson. She's 30 years old. She started a company called Marie Oliver. Uh, it's a clothing brand that now sells in Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom, online. It's high-end clothing that she started right here in Greensboro. She's grown it. She's got like 15 employees now. She's doing six figures in revenue, if not more. Uh, but she's going to be coming to UNCG to talk about what it was like for her to get started and how if you want to break into the fashion industry, you can get started as well. And that's going to be the last Wednesday in September. It's either the 25th or the 26th, I can't remember, over in the MHRA building at 5 o'clock in the evening. So definitely check that out if that's something you're interested in. She's a rock star. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been at the university for four years. Uh, I got my MBA from UNCG. I've started a couple of different companies, some successful, some not so successful. I've been in sales, marketing, business development. Uh, for a lot of my career, but um, yeah, when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation, I've got a great background with that. So let's look at Lean Launchpad. I mentioned that Lean Launchpad is sort of the base methodology for all this, and it was developed by a guy named Steve Blake. Steve Blake is an uber successful entrepreneur, billionaire out in Silicon Valley, and he found back when he was starting his companies back in the 80s and 90s, that when he went and approached a company with, hey, I've got this software, would you like to buy it? He didn't get a lot of sales that way. So he flipped up what he did. He went in there and he started asking questions to these companies. He said, what problems are you having? What are some stop gaps within your processes? If, if you could develop an ideal solution, what would that look like? And then at the end of that conversation, he would say, 
well, that's awesome that you have all those problems. I've actually developed software that solves those exact problems. And then he went back after he left the meeting and he built that software. So he you know, was a little facetious with what he said he actually had, but he found out he got a ton more sales when it came to just learning about what the customer's problems were and then developing solutions to those problems. I'm sure everybody in here has had business ideas of, oh, I think people would like this and I think people would want that. But until you get out there and really talk to people and really learn, is this a common problem that a big chunk of people have and are they willing to pay for it, you really don't know. Those are just hypotheses. And so it's pretty much the scientific method for developing a solution or an innovation. You've got this hypothesis that a certain group of people is gonna derive value by this idea or service or product that you have, but if that's all it is, it's a hypothesis, it's just an assumption. And so you run an experiment, which is going out there and talking to those customers and asking them questions to really learn, is this gonna solve a problem for them? Is it gonna create a gain for them? You can't validate or invalidate that hypothesis is true or false. And uh, that's really the way to evaluate um, you know, a business idea or some sort of opportunity that's out there, is, is utilizing this methodology. Uh, and it's evidence, so evidence-based and empathy-based. So the two most important things is you're basing all of your decisions on evidence and data. You're not just basing it on your gut feeling. And you're looking at it from an empathetic perspective, whereby you're uh, you're really trying to learn and connect with your customers to really give them what they want. Or whoever you're going to impact, you're trying to give them exactly what they want. One big part of this lean launch pad methodology is something called the business model canvas. And I know that this is probably going a little bit too far for what you're working on in your class here. But this is still a very helpful tool. This is sort of a mini business plan, and there's one called a mission model canvas as well. You can Google this, you can Google lean launch type methodology. There's all sorts of data out there, and there's articles, videos, all, all kinds of stuff out there on this if you, in case you want to look more into it. But the business model canvas is sort of like a mini business plan that sits on one page. It helps you organize your ideas and look at all the integral pieces <coughs> for starting and running a business or evaluating an idea. So even if you're in an existing company and you want to come up with a new idea, you still have to hit all these other pieces, such as your key activities, who your partners are gonna be, who your customers are, and what's the value proposition you're providing them. This is a very critical tool that helps you understand your mission as well as your customers. So maybe the most valuable piece of this for you all, for this project, is to look at this and think about what is my, who, the person that I'm interviewing or the person that I'm gonna impact in this project, what is their business like? What is their, what are the things that they're having to get done? And we're going to take this step farther because there's two parts of this business model canvas that I want you to focus on. And that's the middle part and the part on the right there. And I know it's kind of tough to read, but this one is the value proposition right here in the middle. And then customer segment on the right. So all of us are customers. We all buy certain things for a certain reason. And there's a lot of companies that group us in with other people that are similar to us that buy products for a certain reason. And it's called the value proposition. We value a certain thing. You know, I've I might be buying this because I like to keep, uh, because it's maybe it's because it's light and it keeps my, my water cold throughout the day. Another person might buy it because it fits within their cup holder and it keeps their coffee warm in the morning. It's the same product, but people are buying it for different reasons. And you can all relate to that with, how, with the kind of products you purchase. Like think about a pickup truck, you know, a farmer might buy it because of the towing capacity and how much it can haul, but another woman in the big city might buy it because it's big and it's safe and it's got a lot of cup holders, but they're buying the same product. Uh, so, I mentioned earlier about pains and gains with this value proposition canvas. And that's exactly what this is here. Is on the right, you've got a customer. You've got a person that you're gonna, that you all have to interview for this project. There's certain things that they have to get done in their job. There's tasks. There's things that are painful about getting those tasks done or annoying. And there's, th there's gains that they'd be looking for of, hey, what could make this better or cheaper or more efficient or faster? And then over here, this is your idea. This is your innovation right here, your product or service that's gonna deliver those gains, that's gonna alleviate those pains. And you can see how they're sort of inextricably linked between these two. So any questions about the value proposition canvas here? This is a really cool tool. Highly recommend you look into it for any kind of problem you're looking to solve. So let's dive into the meat and potatoes, the customer discovery here. And there's sort of a process to what you're going through here when it comes to evaluating a business idea. And it all starts with problem-solution fit. And you all are already kind of at this stage, is 
you've been able to identify a problem that enough people care about uh, with a intensity large enough that they're willing to take action on it. So you all have identified there's an overpopulation problem with deer as well as horses in certain geographic areas of the United States. That's a real problem. It's, it's there. It's real. We've been able to validate, because again, we go back to the scientific method of hypothesizing and validating or invalidating our hypothesis. This has been a validated hypothesis right here. This is a fact. This is true. Next up is product market fit, and this is where you all come in. Can you design a product or process that delivers value in a way that your customers want to consume it? So we validated there's a problem out there. Can we design a solution to help solve this problem? Or create some sort of game there where people really do want to use the solution that we come up with. So we validated there's a problem, and we've come up with a solution. Next up, is there a business model fit? So is there going to be a way for us to make enough money with this to where it's going to make financial sense to do this? Like, yeah, the, the uh, company that you're working for right now, they could spend two, three, four, five million dollars developing this pharmaceutical solution to uh, cut the deer population or sterilize deer, but if no one's willing to pay for it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to just spend all this money to develop this solution. Their time would be spent better, better doing something else. They're entrepreneurs, they're trying to make money. So you have to consider what is the business model fit. And sometimes there's not a business model fit, so you might say, hey, there's a problem that's out there, We've got a solution, but people aren't willing to pay for it, so therefore the pain point's not big enough, we can't develop a business model around it. And there's also nonprofit cases that can be made, but that's sort of a, a different story. Buy and fit. This is sort of the last piece of it. Customer discovery helps you understand what buy-in is needed uh, in order to deploy this product or service and get it into the hands of people that can actually use it. So, we validated there's a problem. Two, we validated that we've got a solution for it. Three, we can make money off of this. Four, how do we get it into the hands of the people that it's gonna impact? So you might just focus on maybe these two middle parts here, maybe it's just the product market fit, but this is sort of the process as you think about, hey, I've got this idea, how can I bring it to market? This is the process that customer discovery is gonna help you work through. So just to reiterate about how value proposition and customer segment are inextricably linked, they are. Customer segment, that's like a demographic. So this is a group of people that share common traits and reasons with why they buy a certain product. Uh, then you get into some further categories or archetypes. And I'm gonna move to the next slide to show you what some of the archetypes are. One of the keys is to get very specific with this kind of thing. So the more specific you can get, the better you can define what the value propositions are for these different groups. Uh, so let's explore as an example here as a pharmaceutical drug for human consumption. Well, hospitals are probably going to be a customer of that. Let's get a little more specific. It's university teaching hospitals or for-profit non-university teaching hospitals. And there's a whole bunch of different little subgroups in between. But you got to understand there's differences between all these different subgroups. So who's the customer for a new drug? There's a whole bunch of different customers when you think about it. There's the person that's actually gonna be taking the drug, deriving the benefit from it. But what about the person administering the drug or the person prescribing the drug? The person paying for the drug, like the insurance company, the hospital deciding if they wanna carry that drug or not. Uh, the, the pharmacist deciding if they do actually wanna grant that prescription or not. There's all sorts of little people along the way whose decision matters for this to be successful that you may not even think about. You may think about, hey, if I'm a drug company, I just want to design a drug that people are going to take. There's so many different things to consider along the way. Just like with you all, for the purpose of this project. Uh, let's get into the deer example. Maybe deer, so there's people, there's farmers whose soybean crops are getting eaten up. There are hunters who want to go out there and have access to, um, to harvesting deer. There are, there's the uh, Department of Transportation who has to deal with all the carnage when a uh, deer gets run over along the road. There's um, health insurance that has to pay, or insurance in general that has to pay when a car gets hit, and if somebody gets hurt when they hit a deer with a car. So there's all a bunch of folks to consider along the way when you're looking at developing this kind of solution. And some of those are broken down as to the beneficiaries who are actually receiving the value, the end user as well, uh, the decision maker, the person that makes that, that choice, the payer, the influencer, recommender, and then lastly is the saboteur. So I know that one of the basis of this is you want to develop a pharmaceutical solution to sterilize deer that's going to prevent uh, the population from rising. Well, there might be a lot of hunters that are out there that say, 
no, no, that's not the good solution. I would prefer to just get more tags to be able to hunt more deer or let wide the season open. So they might try to get in your way and stop you and prevent you from getting funding or taking this idea to market. So a saboteur is still somebody that's not gonna really help you, but you still need to learn from them to understand their perspective, the empathy piece of it. Does that make sense? All right, so let's look at best practices here. The most critical one you're gonna hear me say multiple times today is do not sell your product. You are not there to talk about the solution that you have here. You are not there to talk about how great your idea is. Um, I'm sure everybody has, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of you think that that's what you're gonna be doing during this interview, is saying, hey, I've got the solution, what do you think? That's not a good way to do it. You're gonna automatically influence them and bias any kind of answer that you get after that. Because the chicken's kind of out of the, or the cat's out of the bag, if you will. They already know what you're getting at, and it's, and it's already influenced what sort of answers that they're going to get. So you don't want to go talk about your solution. You don't want to go and sell your product and get them to like your idea. That's not the point of this exercise. You're there to listen and dig. Why, why, why? You'll hear me say a lot today about the five whys, where when somebody gives you an answer, really try to go a layer deeper, and then a layer deeper than that, almost the subconscious level about why somebody's making a certain choice. And I call these customer discovery interviews, but it's really a conversation because you want to have a back and forth and you want this to sort of meander as you're able to dive in and learn more about exactly what they're looking for. So your personal development along this journey. Again, if you don't take anything from this, think about this beyond just a class project. Think about this as a chance for you to develop some of your soft skills that you can use the rest of your life. And this is the process that you're going to be working through as you get more comfortable with these. And I know you're only supposed to do one of these for your class project, but really impress Professor Beasley here and do three or five or ten of these. The programs that I, that I run over a four-week period, I have the participants do 30 of these. So you can definitely do that. But here, and it's only going to make you better. First thing you're going to learn is the mechanics of this thing. Like how to get an interview, how to come up with questions, how to go do the interview. Just learn the mechanics about what this is like. Then you're going to take it a step further in learning, oh, I get all that, I get the strategy on how to do it. Where do I fit into this? What are the things that I'm lacking? What can I improve upon? What sort of influence do I have on this process? So you become sort of self-aware as to this whole process. And then the last piece and the most critical piece at all you want to arrive at is analyzing the data. Turning your data into actually actionable information. Uh, because there's no point in going through this process if you're not going to leverage that data as evidence to make better decisions. So how to ensure quality interviews got three critical things here. And, um, and also I see a lot of people taking notes, which is, which is great, but I'm also gonna provide you all the PowerPoint. Uh, don't talk about your solution. I just talked about why you're not there to sell your product. You're not there to get somebody to say your baby's pretty. The interview <laughs> process must be deliberate. So don't go in there and say, oh, I've got these questions to ask. I'm just gonna just ask them just to get this project done. You're interviewing this person for a specific reason. You're there to ask them questions because they are an expert at something and you want to learn something specifically for them. If you interview more than one person, which would be great, you're going to want to learn different things from different people. I talk about all those different customer segments and subgroups that you can interview. They all have different things going on. They are, they're all incentivized differently. They all have different opinions. So you want to be very intentional when you go in and interview these folks about exactly what you're trying to get out of that interview. Lastly, a survey is not an interview. Anybody can go to SurveyMonkey, throw 20 questions up, and then email it to 50 people and get a couple of responses. That's not what this is about. You're not gonna get anything out of that. One, it's not in person. Face-to-face -face is the best way to do these. 90% of communication happens uh, non-verbally. So you're not gonna get any of that. There's no rapport, there's no dialogue, there's no back and forth. You got just a little bit of text there, and you're gonna interpret that however you think you, know, you, you, you want to, which is gonna be incorrect. You're also limiting on the kind of responses that you can get. Nobody's gonna spend half an hour writing a super long answer that they would spend you know, just five minutes explaining in a conversation. And also you're limiting them to typically multiple choice when you use a survey. A survey is not good, it's not effective, it's not good data. You all don't need to use a survey for this project. And I'll get later about the type of techniques that you should use. The typical questions you wanna focus on, what, how, and why. So when you ask a what question, you're typically talking about what the solution is, what's the project, what's the product. 
how those are going to be the kind of features. How would you do this? How would you do that? The person that you're talking to is going to describe some of the features that they have. And then why? That's the value. That's the reason why they want to do all this stuff. So four steps in this process, planning, landing, conducting, and analyzing the interview. Let's look at planning first. The most important thing is to understand your problem, your innovation, and your solution. So I'm sure you've dove into the problem a little bit here, but really how much have you looked into this? Have you looked at how uh, the deer population has increased over the past 20 years in this area? Have you looked at what solutions are, have been tried in the past? Have you looked at the specific geographic areas? When it comes to the innovation or solution that you're evaluating here, the pharmaceutical solution, how much have y'all looked into that? Have you talked to the entrepreneur and looked at their history? Have you seen, are there any other drugs that are out there that have done something like this? Really understanding the solution problem, just getting a good baseline for this is gonna help you develop better questions, better hypotheses that are ultimately gonna deliver better results in the end. So preparing for success, or you know, preparing is, is critical. Another thing with planning is figuring out who you should interview. So again, just to reiterate, there's all sorts of different people you should interview. And what I would recommend you all do is come up with a list of every person you can think of. Come try to come up with a list of 30 different types of people you should ask who you should, who you should interview. Again, have a purpose, be intentional, don't waste your time, don't waste their time. Start at the bottom and then work your way up. A lot of people think, hey, I want to talk to the to the highest level decision maker. But a lot of times they don't, they're making a different type of decision than the person that at the ground level is making. They're making more strategic decision versus at the bottom. So the person at the top, they may just see your what you're working on here as a line item in a budget. And that's it. They don't know how it works, what it does, it's just a number to them. But the person out at the bottom that's actually going to be implementing this and making the real decision and seeing the impact, they might have more, way more information than the person at the top would. Also starting at the bottom, because you all are going to be very green in this. Like you might think you know a little bit about this problem. You might think you know a little bit about the Wildlife Commission or whatever it is, but you don't really know. So going through this and learning from the people that are down there on the ground level is critical because it's going to it's going to make you better informed and also make you ask better questions as you move your way up. Typically when you get a high level person, you only got one shot with them and you really want to impress that person. And if you come in and ask them some dumb questions, you're, it's not going to look very good. So you can get your dumb questions out of the way early and you can ask much better questions as you move your way up. So here's how you go about finding these folks to interview. The best way to do it is to get a warm introduction from somebody within your network. This could be a professor, this could be a family member, a friend. It could be somebody you're connected with on LinkedIn and you see, oh, you're connected with this other person, would you mind sending me an introduction? You know, 99 times out of 100, if, so, if I send a connection to somebody with saying, hey, I've got this student here, they're interested in talking to you, 99 times out of 100, you're gonna get a response, yes, I'd be happy to, to meet with them. Why? Because they trust me. They trust I'm not gonna waste their time, they trust I'm there to really help somebody. And it's not just somebody approaching them out of the blue. Obviously, Google is going to be a great source for you all to find stuff. But one of the things you might want to look up on Google is something called SIC and NAISC codes. So every company in the United States that files taxes is given a code. And those codes can get pretty specific to the type of business. So it's not just going to be all marketing companies, but it's going to be public relations companies or advertising companies or web development companies. There's all sorts of subgroups within there. And if you Google SIC code, you're going to find a website that lists every single company within a specific SIC code. So you can search within a zip code and search within 10 mile radius of that area, and it's going to spit out every single company that has that code within that area. So it's a great way to identify companies that don't, you know, aren't, aren't on the first page of Google. Uh, LinkedIn, obviously a great way for those of you who don't, don't have LinkedIn pages, I would recommend you set one up tonight and start using that. Uh, any of these company names that you find in Google or find in the SIC code, you throw in that company name in LinkedIn, it's going to show you that pretty much everybody has a, uh, a LinkedIn page, every company has a LinkedIn page, and you're going to be able to click that and see the employees that work there. So you can get a specific name, you can see what their title is, what their job description is, all the LinkedIn, and that's going to give you the ability to identify the specific person that you should interview for this project. Or think about what career you want down the road. Maybe you want to be an accountant or a marketer or whatever. 
you think you know what that what that job's like, but you really don't. And so you go talk to somebody that has that career, you really don't know what your day-to-day -day life is going to be like. So I highly recommend all you do, all of you do informational interviews with that. And utilizing this strategy in LinkedIn is going to be one of the best ways that you're going to be able to identify specific people to go and interview and talk to. Uh, trade organizations and publications. So every industry has some sort of trade organization that's out there. Uh, these are groups that help share best practices, they'll have conferences, they'll put out a monthly newsletter or publication just to help keep the companies and businesses and individuals within that industry up to date with what's going on and also provide networking opportunities and shared resources. Every one of those organizations is going to list of their member team, their member companies, maybe even have individuals that are members. Look at that. Great way to identify people. Also, every trade organization has some kind of leadership or board. See who's on their board. That group is going to know everybody within that industry. Great people to know. Conferences. Even if you don't attend a conference, you can still go to a conference webpage and see who's having a booth there, who's a speaker that's going to be there, what companies are sponsoring this thing. Great way to identify companies that are focused around a certain industry or program. And then social media, obviously, you all know how to use, uh, use that to find and identify and connect with people. All right, so we've planned, we've been able to identify a person, use a comfortable thing to do. If you've never done it, you're going to be intimidated, you're not going to enjoy it. But the more that you do with this, the better that you're going to get. And it's something that is an invaluable skill. Um, so yeah, and you'll learn all sorts of techniques about how to be successful with that. The technique that I'm going to give you all that's going to get you guaranteed interviews is by using this line here. Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a researcher at UNCG working on a project in your field. I was told you were an expert and I should talk to you about this project. Do you have 15 minutes that I can come and speak with you? You're going to get a yes every time. You're a UNCG student, okay? So you all have a status that I don't have. I'm just some Joe on the street. You all are a student, y'all are the future leaders of America. Leverage your status as a student because people want to help students. People want to help, help you learn. They're going to go home and tell their significant other, man, I got to help a student today. They're going to feel really good about themselves. So take advantage of that. Leverage your status as a student. It's going to unlock a lot of doors for you. Uh, establishing yourself with some legitimacy. So you got the student piece. You're, you're a researcher at UNCG. Wow, you're, doing, you're really here doing research. Uh, you're affiliated with the university. That's again great. You've appealed to their ego. You said you're an expert. Wow, I'm an expert. You know that that makes people feel really good. They'd be happy to, to share and impart some wisdom on you. And then last, you're asking for 15 minutes. Nobody blocks off their calendar in 15 minute segments, so you're going to get at least a half an hour with them. Uh, so, so yeah, leverage that. Practice that little spiel. Look at yourself in the mirror when you do it. And all you gotta do is pick up the phone and call somebody. And I know that for this pro for this uh, this program, you've got to do uh, a letter too, which is great. That's gonna give even more legitimacy to what you're doing. Um, but yeah, practice that. You're really good at that. Uh, and last, be ready to roll into the interview. In case you get somebody on the phone, if they're not busy enough to answer the phone, that means they probably have 10 or 15 minutes they could spend talking on the phone. So if it seems like they're going to say, hey, I don't really have time, well, do you have time? I can ask you one second, one question real quick. And then you can roll into an interview, and if they answer one question, you're probably going to be able to get two or three more out of them, too. So be ready to roll into that interview, have something prepared. Just whenever you pick up the phone to call somebody, just be ready to go. You don't know where it's going to lead. Uh, be wary of gatekeepers, especially as you get higher up. Uh, you'll run into folks that have administrators or assistants that set their schedule and take their calls for them. Just be really sweet and nice to those folks, and that's what's going to help you get in the door with the person that you really want to interact with. Take advantage of conferences and other corporate events. For you all, I mean, you could go to the Dixie Classic Fair down in Raleigh and meet all kinds of the best horse raisers and farmers and stuff around here who would be good interviews. Same with going to the gun show here in Winston or in Winston or here in Greensboro. There's all sorts, you can you have 30 interviews in one day just by going and spending a couple of hours out there. So consider going to these places where there's a high density of people within your target market, or customer size that you're looking for. Uh, look for people no longer working at a specific company. Typically they'll be a little bit more honest and candid about what things were like there, so that's always a positive thing to look for too. All right, so we've planned who we 
want to go talk to. We've identified them. We've called them, we've gotten on their schedule. Now we're about to go and sit down in front of them and ask them some questions and have a conversation with them. Let's see how we can take advantage of that best. Face to face is obviously the most important uh, or the, the best way to go about doing this. Second is going to be Skype. We all have access to you know, all the Google apps that are out there now. Plus, through UNCG, you have uh, WebEx access. Just throw your student ID and everything in there. Um, and Skype as well. But that's going to be the next best option, so you can at least have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. So it will be the next. Uh, so you can at least have a voice conversation. And then, obviously, we want to avoid uh, surveys. We want to avoid emails for all those reasons that I talked about earlier. It's not going to get great data by your last best strategy. Just to reiterate, you're not there to sell your product. You're not there to talk about how great your idea is. That's not the point of this. You're there to get unbiased information. You're there to get data that's going to help validate or invalidate all these different hypotheses you have about what direction your idea should go. <coughs> if I didn't mention it, don't sell your product. You talk about your idea, you're not there to have everybody like your product. You're not there to, you know, not, not hear about these risky assumptions that could plateau your entire business or create your entire business idea. Don't talk about your favorite color or your font. You know, you're not there to sell your idea. So developing questions. I talked about being purposeful and intentional with every interview you go into. It's, it's true. You don't want to ask somebody an irrelevant question. Think about, hey, I've only got 15 minutes for them. Maximize the return on your time invested for this. If you don't prepare, if you don't spend that time ahead of time, you're just wasting their time, and you're wasting your time too. You only got one shot to get data from this person. Take advantage of it. Yeah, you're going to come in with a list of five to 10 questions, but treat this like a conversation. Right? I'm sure there'll be certain things you're going to get, you, you want to get answered, but let the conversation guide you. Just don't hit it. You know, checkbox next to the question as soon as you've asked it. Let it flow, create a conversation. Uh, use common language, and this, uh, I typically give this presentation to a lot of high level researchers, chemists, biochemists that speak a whole different language that sounds like jargon, just a bunch of jargon to me, and I don't understand this. So I try to tell them when you talk to these folks, they're not experts like you are, so try to use language that you would use with a five year old. Like, how would you explain this to a five year old? So, and the same goes with them. A lot of the folks you're gonna to talk to are using some common industry language that you may not be familiar with. It's okay to say, what, what did you mean by that? I, I've never heard that term. What, can you explain that more to me? Because the basis of all this is for you to understand and get data that you can interpret. Critical here, you were, again, you're not there to have them just confirm all of these things that you think are right. You were there to find where the holes are in your idea. You want them to invalidate. You want them to say things that you were not expecting. That's what should really intrigue you. Whenever they say something that you were not expecting or goes against what your assumptions were, that's the direction you want to take the whole conversation. Well, tell me why that's not the case, or why is that the case? Because you want to, you're there to make discoveries. That's why it's called customer discovery. You are there to discover things that you didn't know were there. And that's what's ultimately going to lead to a more impactful, better product innovation idea at the end of it. Uh, don't scratch the surface, but take a deep dive. We talked about adding the why. So if there's just a surface level, go deeper, deeper, deeper. You want to get to the subconscious level about why they really feel a certain way. Don't fear about picking the wrong person. You may get five minutes into the interview and realize, oh, you're not the person I should be talking to. But still, you can, you can find some kind of value there. Think about maybe modifying your questions or modifying the conversation to maximize whatever you can get out of that person. Uh, pair it back to confirm. So whenever somebody gives you an answer, just give them a quick little synopsis back of, oh, did you mean this? Or I just want to make sure I, under, I heard you correctly, but you mean this. And just refer, read back to them. Maybe use the same language. Maybe you phrase it your own way of just, I just want to make sure I interpreted that correctly. So when you're putting together questions, ask open-ended questions. Obviously, you don't want to ask things that are multiple choice or just require a yes or no answer. Your whole goal is to get them talking as much as they can. Get them talking as much as they can. And asking open-ended questions is the only way you're going to be able to do that. Who, what, why, and how. I mentioned that earlier, but the five whys. Just, again, encouraging you all to dig deeper. Avoid is, are, would, do you think, and should. Because 
I challenge any of you to try to think of a question that's open-ended that starts with one of those. You're already, if you say is or are, or when you do this, you're already putting an, an idea in their head. You're already putting some kind of implicit bias in there by just how you phrase the question. And it may not seem like a big deal, but it is. Because you're already giving them a starting point. You want the starting point to be floating around in their head, and they pick it. You don't want to pick it for them. Avoid that confirmation bias, which is what I talked about. Focus on getting them to say things that you didn't expect to hear. And the two critical things to finish with are, so let's say you've asked all your questions. One of the last questions you want to end with are, hey, you've gotten a gist of what I'm talking about here. So by the end of the interview, they know what you're trying to get at. They know the kind of information you're trying to get. But, but ask them, what should I have asked? What didn't I ask that you think might be valuable for me to know? And that might open up another, another 15, 20 minutes of uh, great data, great content for you to build your ideas off of. And then the last one, is there anybody else you think I should meet? Is there anybody else you think I should talk to about this? So I know you're only supposed to interview one person, but let's say your goal is five. You could create sort of a daisy chain and you interview this one person and then they refer you to somebody else, then they refer you to somebody else, and they refer you to somebody else. That's a fantastic strategy and it's going to help you rack up interviews like that. And plus you're going to get that warm introduction from somebody that you've already talked to, so you're not going to have to cold call anymore. Two great pieces of advice right there. Our last part, so we've done our interview. Let's look at uh, digesting and debriefing all of this data that we've collected. So it is data. And what you do with data is you try to create recognizable patterns. So let's say you interview 10 people and you're seeing a common thread. There's common things that they keep talking about. So that's obviously going to be where the opportunity is, is more and more people keep talking about the same thing. We've got to develop something that caters to that idea. It could be a feature. It could be a product. It could be a delivery method. It could be something that they say will never work. But you want to recognize those patterns and incorporate those into your idea. Because remember, we want data-driven decision-making, evidence-based decisions, not just because I feel this way or I think this way. We want to prove it by data. So these five things are what you're trying to accomplish in this interview. So this is kind of a synopsis of all of this. One, what are your customers really trying to accomplish? Like, what are they really trying to get done? So you're really trying to understand them. How are they measured? What metrics, what are the success metrics that they have? How are they measured? How are they evaluated? Because that's going to influence their decision, is based on achieving what their goals are. What are they currently doing to meet their objectives? So that could be a current solution. It could be a workaround. It could be whatever they're doing right now to accomplish whatever the goal is. So for you all of you, it might just be we expanded the hunting season by a week. Uh, what are the top three obstacles preventing their progress? So there's barriers, obviously. If it was an ideal world, they would already have the solution. You all wouldn't even have this project to work on. But there's obstacles that are in the way that are preventing this. And then lastly, what would it take for you to change your current solution or work around to utilize a new solution? I'm not going to say what your product is, but just a new solution. So what would make them change their behavior? Bottom line is get out of the building. Get off the campus. Get out of the classroom. That's where you're really going to learn. You can spend all kinds of time doing research online. And I know nobody loves getting out and talking to people, but that's where you're really going to learn. That's where you're really going to make a breakthrough on this project. So get out of the building. Get off the campus. And go talk to people. It's my info. Please visit our, and our other website is startup.untg.edu. Check out all the stuff that we have going on. Tons of resources for you all to get involved. Uh, if you think I can help you at all, send me an email or give me a call if you've got a business idea, innovation. If you just want to connect with the local or regional entrepreneurial ecosystem, just send me a note. We'd love to help you out. So what questions do you all have? I know we covered a lot there, but I know you got some questions. Let me ask about this. You're in there doing the interview. How are you going to document the information that this person that you're interviewing is giving you? My book. Hmm? I would say a recorder. Half the time, try to record. Fantastic. If you could record, everybody's got a little personal recording device in their pocket right now. If you could record every interview that you did, that'd be phenomenal. Just make sure to get their permission. Just say, hey, you know, I'm doing research on this. I really want to make sure I get all the data points you're talking about so I can go back and re listen to this. Uh, I'm not going to share it with anybody. But would you mind if I recorded recorded this? That'd be fantastic. That's great. What if you can't record? What's something else you can do? Take notes. 
Fantastic. Take a little notepad in there, just jot some notes down, and you probably won't have a lot of time for any journalism majors to write down every single thing that they say, but if you can make sort of main headlines about major words that they say, maybe there's that one thing that they said that really set it apart, it's going to help trigger in your memory when you go back and digest and debrief later. A lot of folks want to take laptops to take notes, but that can be distracting, so you've got a screen that's sort of up there between you, and plus you're hearing the click of the keyboard, so try to avoid taking a laptop. Take one of your partners with you from your group too to take notes while you're doing the, the heavy lifting of the talking and the asking of questions. Yeah, taking multiple people is, is always great because you know because you might hear different things, you might interpret what they said differently, and you're both taking notes, so you may pick up on different uh, different keys. Yeah. Um, so with inter inter informational interviews, sometimes I feel like it's a little bit awkward just to like start them, just because I feel like you like sit down and then you're like. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so, do you have like a, any like tips or like pointers for like starting it? Because once you get into the conversation, it's easier, sure. but it's it can be kind of like awkward to like just you know, like. Yeah, the easiest question to start off an informational interview with is just tell me what your day is like. Tell me what your typical day is like. That's always a great easy one. So this goes kind of beyond the class here, but like I said, I can't recommend enough. I tell this to all the students that I've talked to is to go do multiple informational interviews with people that are doing what you want to be doing in five or ten years, okay? The main things that you want to get out of that are, you know, what's your day-to-day -day like? What do you wish you knew about this field before you went into it? Uh, the third one is, if you were in my shoes, what would you, what, what should I do right now to prepare myself to be successful? And then the fourth one is, who else should I talk to about this? Good question. What are some other questions y'all have? What are your fears about this project and this portion of the project, rather, the uh, interviewing of it? No fears? No problems? Okay. Maybe we should have you do five, at least, each. Yeah, you? for a group that's never made a cold call before. <laughs> What you're going to realize is all of your all of your fears about picking up the phone and calling somebody, they're all internal. Like you're just calling another person who's just like you, okay? And you realize you're going to make mistakes on this. Nobody starts off with this and just has extraordinary success. And except you're going to make mistakes, this is all about your professional development, okay? So just get over that and just do it. Because you're never going to get good at this stuff if you just keep researching online how to do it or you keep just practicing on your own. you got to actually take action and do it. Um, for the groups that are doing courses, our problem area is more in like the West. Sure. That's kind of just like where the problem is. We don't have a problem with that in the East. But so, would if we're trying to get like face-to-face -face interviews, because those are typically just like better and just like easier to document and stuff, and more beneficial. Do you have any like recommendations for how we should like? do that within like our community because it just it, to me it doesn't seem like there's a lot of like people to interview that go around here for yeah. a problem that's in the west yeah and we've, we've talked about this in some of the other classes it seems like you know the, the kind of issue here is hey we would love to have more wild horses so it's kind of the opposite problem yeah uh, but you're definitely going to just leverage technology there because i don't think anybody expects you guys to take a flight up jackson hole <laughs> um, and interview somebody at a dude ranch but you could spend time, again, start start with that list that I talked about earlier. Hey, who are 30 different potential people that I can interview? It could be a farmer that owns you know, a hog farm, a thousand acre hog farm in, in Montana. It could be this family that owns a dude ranch in Wyoming. It could be the person that's the wildlife commissioner of South Dakota. Identifying those people and then just reaching out to them, seeing if you can have top of the list again, get a phone or get a, a Get like a teleconference type interview. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all sorts of technology you can use around here, but I mean, you can do it from your phone. And the same goes with them. It's really easy. They, ever, all of them have done this stuff before. Well, except maybe like the cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> you, may not, yeah. you may not have done it, but uh, but they'd all be comfortable doing that kind of stuff. And they understand. And you would just say, it'd be really beneficial for me if I could just have have face to face. And I completely understand if you don't want to, we can just do a phone call. So you've always got the phone call as backup, but. Just take a shot. The worst they're going to say is no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions for Mr. Shelley? Well, good. Well, thank y'all. You got you. my info. Reach out.